Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Now we are starting to move into how so many Indian tribes came in Arabia and they settled where they settled. But prior to that, you need to understand the trade routes of Arabia. The trade routes of Arabia that started as early as 2000 BC, different people took control over different areas of this trade route that would connect the Europe with Yemen. And the trades that are coming from different parts of the world to Yemen need to be transported all the way to the Byzantine Empire and Persia. And the goods coming through Persia needs to be transported to Yemen. That itself was a big deal for a lot of kingdoms as they were solely surviving on the tax money that would come out of these trades. They would put up the markets where people will come, do buying and selling, and they will charge heavy taxes to the business people. The business people would have to sell their commodities because they were extremely famous in the local markets. Especially the goods that are coming out of Arabia and Africa, which are the fragrance, the myrrhs, and also the incense. And these were used not only in religious ceremonies, but also it was to show the richness and was also used in several different facilities to minimize the sewage orders. Because the people back in those days didn't have the same kind of lifestyle that you would experience in so-called the civilized world of today. They didn't have the line system that we have today. However, they were quite modern considering the 2000 BC or 1000 BC or even in the earlier times, 1500, 1600 years ago. So at that point, different goods need to be transported from different parts of the world to the other parts of the world. We learn about the Lachmites, which, are, which were settled back then in modern day Iraq and they were settled in parts of Saudi Arabia, extending all the way very close to where the Bahrain is. And the Sassanids, the Persians, had a great influence over these people. And different people at different point in time were controlling the Persian Gulf and the trade that was happening over there. There were different smaller settlements that were uh, around the coastal line and that was one of the driving forces behind so many Indian tribes moving out of the India and settling by the coastal line. And also you need to understand as reported by some of the historians uh, from China that as early as 400 ADE, they saw some Arabs settled in the islands by Serendip, by Sri Lanka, in the southern tips of India. And those Arab traders were living a very, very lavish life in those settlements. And they were trading timber. They were timber tradesmen. So there were a lot of goods and commodities that were moving back and forth between Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it was extending from the Horn of Africa to as far as China, into the Byzantine Empire, into the Persian Empire, into the Indian subcontinent, and all over Arabia. And within Arabia, there were several markets, somewhere between 13 to 20 markets. There were shifting markets. There were not permanent markets. And that they will start moving around all over Arabia in the 12 months period. Not all businessmen will participate in all the markets. So some markets will be down southeast, some will be down southwest, some will be in the central Arabia, shifting from east coast all the way to the west coast. Some of them will be up northwest by the Syria. Some of them will be up northeast by where we have Iraq region. The reason was because there was a demand, there was a need. And as we have learned, Hashim, the great grandfather of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also had a, um, a small uh, shop, like a remote business shop in Gaza. 
And that's exactly why he would go to Gaza so frequently once a year. And that was where he would start his business in the season that people will be doing business over there. And then in one of those trips, he passed away in Gaza. And he's buried in Gaza. In fact, the people who live in Gaza can probably point you out to his burial place, as I've been told, that it's a known place in Gaza. And if you look at uh, the, uh, the Syrian side uh, over the history, it was once controlled by, in the BC, by the Qadarites, which are, some people believe that they are the descendants of Ismail salam through Qaydar. And some believe that we do not know exactly how they originated, but they were controlling for the most part uh, the, that trade route uh, that was going into the Byzantine. And of course, there were wars. You had to have political allies to survive. Sometimes people would side with Greeks. Sometimes people would side with Persians. And then when in the times of Romans, people had to side with Romans or Persians. So there was a constant shift of power for these smaller kingdoms to survive. Sometimes they would lose. Sometimes they will survive. Some of them will die because of the catastrophes that will hit their way. And then the Nabataeans came afterwards. And then they were controlling uh, the Syrian area, and they were growing, and they were growing, um, and they built massive city like a city of Petra, and that's where they built this massive economy, wealth, and they were controlling that route. And this is all in the early BC and in, in late BCs and early A A ADs. So we're talking about that time frame over here. This is pre-Islamic time frame, and now. Uh, over the period of time, the trade route is growing and growing and growing. More people are joining it. And that was one of the times when um, the forefathers of Prophet wasallam, somewhere around the time of Qusay, when the Quraysh started coming into Mecca, they realized that the Jurhum and Khuza'a, they were both extremely reliant on the money coming into the Mecca because of the pilgrimage. There must be other ways of sustaining money as these people have come together as several different families under one umbrella of Quraysh. So they started tapping into this trade route. And over the period of time, sooner or later, Arabs started mastering this trading. And by the time of Prophet Wasallam's great-grandfather Hashim, who is grandson of Qusay, the one who restored Quraysh in Mecca, Hashim went around and he started signing trade agreement with the people that we are the caretakers of Kaaba. When our caravans would come, nobody would attack it, nobody would loot it to give themselves a safe passage all the way through the trade routes. And then there were certain civilizations that would master into this trade routes and they would uh, master the water engineering that they will be able to find water sources along the way and they would then uh, dig wells, create posts and would help facilitate uh, the trade and as a result they would charge taxes. They will have higher taxes but again they're providing facilities. So all over Arabia there were smaller or larger different kinds of caravans, uh, bazaars set up for these caravans to arrive and sell their commodities and move on. So that there was a lot of attraction going on around the trade route. The reason I want to talk about all of these things because I want you to understand and realize what was going on in the Arabian Peninsula. We'll talk go a little bit back into the history and then we will connect that and then slowly and gradually move into our main topic in the next one or two days where why Indian tribes moved here and who are they and where were they coming from. So this is basically important for you to see what were those bazaars so that you understand how trade was happening within the Arabian Peninsula other than just simply connecting the Yemen to Byzantine and Byzantine to Yemen because that's where Meccans were flourishing because they tap into this opportunity that we are right in the middle. We can go once a year to Yemen and once a year to Syria and we can be that connecting here that there were different people holding the trade routes 
we had Hadarites, uh, which were at some point in time, which were the children of Qadar, were holding the trade routes. And again, you know, this is the information that some historians are confused about as to who exactly were the Qadarites. Similarly, um, uh, Nebe ne Nebatians, we talked about the Nebatians, they, hold, they held the trade route and they held it pretty firmly for a very long time and they gained control of the caravan routes between the Arabia and the Syria. So we're talking about down south where we have the Hadramaut and uh, Shabwa and all of these Sana'a and all of these regions in the south and you see this blue line that connects the south with that of the north and up north we have a very important place like Petra, Gaza, Jerusalem and all of this trade route uh, which uh, incense is a very heavy commodity on this trade route and at one point in time prior to uh, Nebatians uh, taking this the Seleucids and the Ptolemies uh, you know, who were in the, uh, they were in conflict with each other. They, at one point in time, they also gained control of it. But Nabataeans had been here for a very long time. And uh, we're talking about early history of probably 1900 BC to 600 BC. And these Nabataeans were actually Arab tribes. And they were nomads. They used to wander around in this region. And the other tribe, the Qadarites, uh, were known for their military powers, but, but Nebatians were actually um, extremely skillful in finding waters because they roam around the Arabian Peninsula for a very long time and they mastered the art of water finding. And um, they were very much familiarized with the trade routes. Over the period of time, they established themselves in uh, Petra and uh, they became extremely efficient in holding the trade routes and between the 600 to 200 bc time frame they began using boats to pirate on the red sea and later on the mediterranean sea and they established gaza as you can see over here where the green line is the green arrow going out that's where they started using gaza as a main port and um, also between the 250 to 100 BC, three kingdoms existed in the southern Arabia. Two inside kingdoms faced the desert and handled all of the contract with the other Arab traders. So there was the trading going on from down south all the way up north. Between the era of 100 BC to 85 BC, the Nabataean port city of Gaza, it was losing its importance. And most Nabataean, Arabian, and Asian trades seem to be passing through Alexandria, which is in Egypt, versus coming through the Gaza. So Gaza was then eventually lost to Jewish control. And then between the 20 to 30 BC, during the Roman campaign to South Yemen, to discover the source of uh, frankincense, which was the major commodity of trade, the incense we talked about, the Nabataeans not only managed to destroy the Roman army through deception, they effectively used the Romans against the uh, people of Hadramaut, the Hadramites. And while they did not defeat these kingdoms, they severely weakened them so that the following year, the Hamurites began to conquer them. So that's how the Hamurite um, start conquering the Hadramites and the Minyans. Eventually, Hamurites took control over this, and this is all happening in the BCE. And this is before Isa alayhi salam's birth, all of these things are happening. And after Isa alayhi salam, 106 AD or so, the Roman Empire acquired the Nabataean Empire. Now, you have to keep in mind when they were building Petra city, the Petra is very much out, out of the scope. It is out, out, out of the main scope and uh, the reason it became so successful first of all nobody would dare to go near their place because it was so out of line and secondly the water was missing in that area so what these people will do they since they engineer uh, they had water engineering expertise they built um, dams to control the flash floods they had water basins, they had raised water basins, they built containers in different places within their cities and um, aqueducts. They would, they would transport water from far distances with the help of the aqueducts into the city and they had this beautiful plan running. 
and they had built the city of uh, Petra on a trade route and that would allow them to control the instant trade that was coming from south to north or going from north to south and then they would tax these people and the trade route that they built as you can see here the blue line that they were controlling or the green lines that they were controlling they built so many cities on that line if you can see we have Allah we have Petra we have Gaza uh, and we have Luz and all of these cities that they build, and then uh, even on the blue lines, they build like uh, Madian, where Saleh is from, or Tema, or Jauf, or Khaybar. All of these cities are maybe a day's distance from each other. And uh, these cities would not only provide a resting place for the moving caravan, which would take approximately, this is a 1200 mile distance from south to north. It was. It is not just a, a resting place, but this is actually a selling point for a lot of these caravans as they are moving from south to north or coming down from uh, north to south. So they would be selling their goods as they're moving towards the destination and then they, then they will take their final goods towards their destination. And as you can see in the pink lines, you can see that uh, through the Silk Route, it is going as far as China. And also through the Sea Route, as you can see the green line, it goes past the um, Af Horn of Africa, between the Af Horn of Africa and Yemen. And then it is touching all these coastal posts of Cain and Aden, which is Aden and uh, Mocha and then it is going all the way to China and India and that's how it is getting connected over there. So they have a, a, a land route through the Silk Road going into the China and also the sea route and they're controlling all of these things. So the reason I'm, I'm showing you all of these things, I'm, I'm trying to show you that way before Muckins enter into the trading business, uh, we have had very established trade routes. And Makkans originally only concentrated on the land-based trade routes where the, where the people from Yemen were taking more advantage of land and the sea-based trade routes. And the goods were coming from China and India were getting sold in the markets of Yemen, which were then traveling through the um, Arabian tribal tradesmen into the different nook and corner of Arabia. As you can see, uh, uh, north from the empty quarter, we have other marketplaces where you see the blue line. So it looks like Arabs were trading in different places all year round. And then there's a whole schedule of that that I want to share it with you. But how about if we put it for the next time because the video itself is approximately 20 some minutes long. I just wanted to give you a brief idea of what these um, the, the, the trading environment within Arabia look like. And we're talking about uh, 2000 years BC all the way till the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that 25, 2600 uh, years of a time frame we're talking about here. So I hope that gives you some idea as to how things were happening back in those days. And this will help you transition better when we, I specifically talk about the Arabic markets. Once I talk about the Arab markets within the Arabian Peninsula, that will then help you understand that why so many people from the Sindh and Hind were moving into this region and, um, and what is Sindh and what is Hind. As I told you, this will take us several lectures maybe a week or two, maybe more, to just understand this whole thing. That's why I'm going a little bit slower. I know you've been waiting anxiously for me to get to that area that you're more interested in, but to get to that area, you need to be able to understand this. And you need to know that Arab ports were also available in the Indian subcontinent. For example, as early as 3rd century BC, we have had a port in Kerala, India, and we have found rock inscription left by the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka there. And in the first century AD, this region became famous among the Arabs and Greeks and Romans for its spices. And during the first five centuries of the AD, which is before in the pre-Islamic era, the region was part of uh, um, uh, Tamil Khan, and this was some, sometimes partially controlled by the Eastern Pandya and the, and the Kola dynasty or the Chola dynasties, as well as the Cheras. And during this time, Arab traders um, came to the coast, purchased spices, and in 1st century AD, Jewish immigrants arrived and Syrian Orthodox Christians believed that St. Thomas the Apostle visited Kerala in the same century. 
Also, we have uh, Konkan India, which is also called uh, Aparanta, which is named for the coastal plain of the Western India. And all of these things are documented in in different documents like the the Gandhara region of India uh, was a crossroad of cultural influences for many centuries during the reign of the Indian Emperor Ashoka we're talking about third century BC and similarly uh, it's quite interesting uh, that to notice that uh, there are two elaborate rock cut tombs on Karg Island in the Persian Gulf which have been found and some archaeologists have noticed a likeness um, to, um, to, to, to the point where we're, we're, we're trying to relate it to maybe Nabitians uh, in, the, um, in the Syrian region. And also, uh, there is an evidence of trade that was happening as far as Indonesia and its 1,000 islands. So there's a lot of things happening in this region. Um, and uh, we also have the evidence of Indian pottery being found in Petra. And uh, identical p pottery was found in different sites, including Petra and some of the Indian sites. And we're talking about between the time era of 100 BC to 200 AD. So as you can see, there was a lot going on in this region. It was not limited to um, maybe a bunch of tribes trying to communicate uh, or trying to sell commodities. We're talking about heavy business going on between continents, between regions which are far away, away from each other. So inshallah, we will cover more of this. But next time, till then, please stay with us. And thank you for your patience. Assalamu alaikum.